And this session, um, which has um, been organised by Lou, uh, is called What Do You Need to Start a Revolution? Question mark. Revisit it. And when we were talking about how to organise this, um, one of the things that came out was that perhaps, as well as <coughs> discussing what kinds of revolutions and campaigns and ideas and things that these community, the community you're in uh, have done already, um, it might be nice to come up with new ideas for some. I, if you've got things that you're itching to change or you think that should change, um, or if you've got skills that emerge from listening to these two, two fine speakers, you think you've got skills that might help in some sort of campaign or someone else's campaign, then this is the kind of community spirited action that we were hoping we could bring together in this, uh, in this program. So um, just to introduce myself, I'm Alok Jha, I'm one of the science correspondents of The Guardian. And to my right is Stephen Curry. He's a professor at Imperial College London in the daytime. At night, he's some sort of superhero, <laughs> campaigning type person. But there he is. He takes off his glasses and something changes. And there you go, look at that. <laughs> and uh, on my left is Sheila Lane, who's the director of campaigns for Sense About Science, um, who, um, if, if you don't know Sheila, you know her campaigns, you know the libel reform campaigns. You know the All Trials campaign. You know, these are some of the most successful campaigns um, concerning some of the things that we are concerned with uh, happening for the last few years. These two are going to share with you their stories, essentially, of how they've become campaigners and activists. Um, and once we've gone through that, I'm hoping just to ask them a few questions on maybe distilling the advice down to a couple of tips, which then I hope you, the audience, will then do the majority of the work in coming up with more ideas. I can't believe for a second that you're just going to want to sit here and listen. We need you to get together on at least three or four campaigns to put onto Sheila's desk probably yeah. <laughs> for next week, although she won't be there, she's going to be on holiday. But someone <laughs> will deal with them afterwards. All right, so first, uh, Superman Stephen Curry. Your, your efforts in this world. I'm afraid when I take off my glasses, I discover that my superpower is blindness. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes him a very good listener. <laughs> so, uh, so Russell Brand famously these days wants a revolution. He's extremely unhappy with the status quo, uh, but his um, modus operandi seems to be based on largely on apathy. And so his major contribution to the debate is to suggest that people don't vote. Uh, now he may well speak for a large section of disaffected youth. That could well be true, but I don't myself among young people anymore, unfortunately. And he doesn't really speak for me, and what I wanted to say today really was about the opportunities that I've had um, to be able to get involved uh, in certain campaigns and share a bit of the experience of that. It still actually surprises me that I've been able to do that. Now perhaps, before I even start, I should check my privilege, which apparently is fashionable these days. Uh, I'm male, I'm white, I'm um, Irish, which of course is... Um, top of the food chain, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm also a professor, and so um, I guess in some people's eyes, then I have a certain type of status, maybe even a, a superhero. Um, but um, I mean, I'm just um, easy to fool journalists. <laughs> but um, but I, I'm actually a bit surprised to sort of find myself invited to a panel like this. We were supposed to have a professional politician, unfortunately, Julian is, is unwell. Uh, but there's a professional campaigner here as well. But I regard myself very much at the amateur end of the spectrum, but I think I'm perhaps not a bad example of uh, what an amateur can actually do if you bother to get off your arse and do something. So uh, when I started out in this, and actually I first attended this conference in 2008, and I wasn't even a blogger then, I was a tentative commenter on various things called blogs, which I think I just discovered at that time. Um, but it struck me that although blogging, of course, has this reputation of being uh, the, an activity largely uh, performed by narcissists who sit in their bedrooms, um, it struck, it's actually, I find it to be a very outward-looking activity, and it has introduced me to, um, well, as I say, sort of writing or thinking out loud on the internet about things that interest me about science has changed my perspective on many different issues and shown me how I actually can get involved. Now, one of my other privileges is that I'm based in London, and of course there's an awful lot of um, political and uh, national activity that's centred on here, so you know, certainly I have an advantage in that way. But I was able to get involved in things like um, 
the labor reform campaign that the Centre of Science was, of course, heavily uh, enmeshed in. I wasn't particularly strongly involved, but I would write about it and I could promote it within the scientific community, try and raise the profile and, and do a little bit. Sheila may um, tell you a little bit more about the sort of nuts and bolts of that particular campaign, which has borne quite remarkable fruit, I would say, uh, just this year. Um, but the thing that um, changed me was um, the Science is Vital campaign, which I got involved in right from the very beginning. And again, it, for me personally, it had its roots in this conference, because in 2010, then Evan Harris actually stood at that podium and gave a talk about how you should go about campaigning. And um, I said a lot of things that made a lot of sense to me. I know even at that conference, I had a conversation that I remember with Alok, who said, who's bitching about um, scientists being stuck in the lab all the time, not looking up in their experiments, and then we should get out a bit more. And you know, once I dried my tears, I, I realized that he probably had a point. And then, so then at that point, uh, famously, Vince Cable made some outrageous speech about you know, less than half of UK science being excellent, which was complete misreading of the ref data, I was actually motivated to say, well, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to write to the newspapers. So <laughs> since Alec had been bending my ear, I wrote to Alec and said, I want to write a piece about this. And actually, I ended up co-writing a thing with Evan. And so we wrote a piece you know, criticizing Vince Cable. And I think that was but actually, somebody else did something even better. And that person was Jenny Brown, who wrote a book and says, uh, stuff this. You know, let's get out on the streets and let's do something about it. And that was a, you know, it was a figurative call to arms, but it was one that was very effective. I was very happy to step in support immediately, as were many other people. And there was a small group that nucleated around uh, that call for action and uh, did actually, I think, make a very big difference to the debate and the final decision-making of government in terms of science funding um, in that post-election period in September, October 2010. So there's a number of reasons I think that that campaign was effective. Now, it wasn't obviously the only thing that was going on at the time. There were many other people lobbying to protect the science budget and to promote the value of science in political spheres. But there's a number of things thinking back, I think, that were important. First of all, you know, one of Evan's uh, very important points was you've got to think about who you're talking to. And in this case, the people you want to get attention of are the politicians. So you've really got to think about getting your message to them but also then for the pressure points, which is trying, of course, to get public support. Something that I think is always going to be a bit difficult for you know, scientific and R&D. You know, we all think it's important, but you know, lots of people think that schools are important and health is important and protecting the aged and, and um, some aspects of the welfare state and all that, that sort of thing. So there's many competing priorities, and one has to fight within that um, uh, domain for it. So thinking about who your, who your message is going to is important. Uh, we had excellent material and expert support, because one of the early people to jump on um, and join in uh, with the sort of action committee was Imran Khan, who was director of CASE at the time. And Imran was a sort of seasoned um, activist, shall we say, knew his way around the corridors of power, knew how you go about to setting up a lobby of parliament, you know, why you should get a petition and how you can then get it to Downing Street. And they were very smart, and we actually had a lot of funding from them as well. They were the ones that paid up for the public liability insurance, which was a thing that didn't know existed. But if you do want to go out and educate in the streets, you need the permission of the police, and you need to have some insurance, otherwise you're going to get the permission. So, um, so we, uh, I don't know, I think the premium has probably gone up since the students rioted on the streets of London. Unfortunately, they did so after our <coughs> particular protest. Uh, we had lots of internet expertise as well, so particularly our, you know, Richard Grant, uh, who helped run our blogging network, Shane uh, McCracken, who was, uh, I got to know through I'm a scientist, and I can't remember the guy's name, but he was Michelle Brooks' boyfriend at the time. So we got a website, so we had a Facebook page, we had a website, and then we could get an online petition started, and we could crowdsource things from that, so the, uh, the fact that we had internet accessibility and that people could see us and we could uh, reach them, that gave us an awful lot of sort of added effort. So we could do mail shots to key people in departments around universities around the country. We didn't know who they were, but we got a Google document together. Lots of people contributed to it and so we could do it. I mean, it was a world away from what, say, British Science was able to do 25 years ago. We had celebrity support, which is important. Evan Harris's uh, little black book of addresses. Uh, was uh, invited to us, so we got people like Daryl Brien to you know, give us a statement and put this picture on the website. Uh, every time Brian Cox tweeted about it, the 
you should sort of have seen just how many signatures suddenly were added to the petition mm -hmm. just because of a single tweet. It was amazing uh, the, the power that, that, that these people have and how valuable their support was. Um, I think you need to think about some publicity. So we did have a rally outside it, and then we had a call that well, uh, scientists coming to rally should wear a white coat, and it should be seen as that. And there was a little bit of uh, bitching, shall we say, in the background, but as all playing to stereotypes, blah, blah, blah. And it is playing to stereotypes, but it makes for a very good photographic opportunity. And there's no question in my mind that it helped to boost the media profile. We got pictures and papers. We got spots on the evening news on TV and spots on the radio. And I think because we made a spectacle of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was, you know, that was very important. So I don't think the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> um, I mean, as a campaign, I think it worked. The feedback that we've got from some people like David Willits and, uh, and Julian as well is that it did have uh, an impact. It was worth making a noise. And, but what the aspect about it which most pleases me is that I think it actually gave back to the scientific community a sense that there was something that they could do that they could stand up for it, and actually when they did stand up, they, they got an awful lot of public support, because you know, the public, the wider public, they really are interested in science, and I think they do get the value of it, and um, uh, it was a very important, I think, for our community probably to learn that lesson. And I'm hoping that you know, it was a good example to set, so that you know, when other things come up, then scientists, the scientific community, uh, will be less reticent about you know, getting out there and agitating um, in the public domain. So um, it, it's you know it certainly changed my approach to engaging you know in the political sphere and actually making you know because I've seen that you know all I was was some new buddy scientist who wrote a blog, uh, but you could get involved in, in something that actually made a difference um, to you know, science policy at the national level. So um, I hope that you know that that sort of amateur experience does then um, suggest that you know everybody in this room is capable of doing something positive to make for change, and it isn't just about reg registering your protest by not voting. Well, Stephen, thank you very much indeed. Um, now we'll hear from Sheila Lane, uh, who um, has done something remarkable in, in the last few years. She's actually managed to change legislation. So Sheila, tell us how you did that. Well, not just me. There was just at least 60,000 <laughs> other people and hundreds of organisations who did that. And that's kind of the point. I should start maybe by saying you don't have to be Irish to be a science <laughs> <man. laughs> <laughs> <But it seems, laughs> uh, This is a fantastic session for a discussion, or a fantastic subject for a discussion session, I think, because there's so much that I'm dying to talk to, about and to tell everybody about. We at Sense About Science have learned a lot about campaigning in the last couple of years. When I joined Sense About Science in 2009, we didn't consider ourselves a campaigning organisation. We didn't have a, a campaigning wing or a campaigning way of working. But I'm now director of campaigns, so we do, we do have all those things. We realise that campaigning and changing the culture and starting revolutions are what we're actually good at, and it's the way we work now. Those of you who don't know, Sense About Science is a small charity, and we were founded to equip people to make sense of science and evidence. So we're a source of information and we counter misinformation and we always stand up for and champion research and high quality evidence. And all the campaigns we run so far have had that at their heart, have had public interest in sound science and evidence at the heart of it. And most of them were aimed at the public. So those campaigns include our campaign for libel reform, um, which took the issue from a no one cares about this esoteric area of the law to as Stephen said, this year's new Act of Parliament. And we wrote the principles of independent scientific advice and we campaigned on those, resulting in them becoming part of the Ministerial Code in 2012. Um, we ran the campaign to roll back the EU Physical Agents Directive, which led to the first time to the UK government deciding not to take up a directive <laughs> from the EU, and that's now being withdrawn by the European Parliament. We're now running the All Trials campaign, which is international, it's global, it's the most international thing we've done, and it's beginning to make, to develop policy changes everywhere, from Europe to the FDA in the States. Um, but international element is something that's really interesting for us as well, so I'm happy to talk about that if it's useful. We campaigned for public and positive <coughs> understanding of peer review, and took that from a no one cares, and no one is going to care about this issue, to something that's a common conversation now. And our Ask for Evidence campaign is our attempt, our biggest attempt and biggest 
culture change. It's about unifying and extending everything we've learned about campaigning into changing society so that everybody's happy and should be talking about sound science and evidence. So we know that some of our ability to do all of those things come from, comes from the fact that we work with a database of 6,000 or more scientists and specialists from every area of science and research you can think of who are signed up to the way we work and who are willing to volunteer their time and their expertise and their passion to the things that we do. So we're so lucky with that. We also work with hundreds of organisations, including science bodies and learned societies, the Royal Society and the RI, down to local science groups, but as well organisations from across civic society, including groups like Mums Net and local authorities and local gardening groups and NGOs and international aid organisations. Um, so we know we have all of that, and that's that's something not everybody has, but there are ways of building up that kind of support and, and background as well. And every one of the campaigns we run has used slightly different ingredients and slightly different combinations, but there are a few common lessons that we've learned over the last few years, and that's what I'm going to tell you about now. First of all, it's that campaigns need to have width and depth. So you need to have a mass of support. You need to have lots of people for both kind of <coughs> internal reasons and external reasons. So with lots of people, it's easier to make your campaign lively. You know that other people are talking to other people about it, so that you don't need to have to do all the communication. Other people will tell the people they need, and it doesn't have to be you all the time raising the issue in every meeting. Numbers ticking up on a counter, on a petition counter, on a website is an important part of a campaign. It's not just because numbers in and of themselves are important, but numbers to up all the time gives a sense of growth and excitement and what other people are joining. And you know, when someone joins something, they really want lots of other people to be joining it too, because they're not there by themselves. Externally, of course, it's good to have impressive numbers to be able to report to the press and to people who might want to donate some money to you. Um, to politicians as well, to show them how many people care about this. And of course, the more people you have, the more people who will do things like write to MPs or write to MEPs or write to companies when the time comes for asking people to get involved in action like that. So you need lots of people, but you also need talisman, you also need exemplars, you also need leaders, people who can, in a kind of shorthand way, illustrate just the kind of people who care about the issue you're campaigning about. So I'm thinking, well, to illustrate that, our current big campaign, All Trials, has 60,000 people signed up to it, but also more than 400 organisations from around the world. And when you run your eyes down the logo from all of those organisations on our website, it gives you a really good idea of the kind of people who, could, uh, who care about this issue. So we've got people from the establishment, like medical royal colleges and the biggest research funders in the UK and around the world, but also tiny little grassroots patient support groups. In fact, the biggest groups of organisations that are signed up are really small patient groups. So it's clear that people from the establishment to political bodies to regulators, right down to grassroots, people want something changed. And that's a really useful kind of shorthand way of telling someone about the campaign they're running to tell them about those kind of people who care. Secondly, the campaign, a campaign would really benefit from having lots of different voices calling for the same thing, but in slightly in different words. So that it's not a homogenous mass of people saying one thing, but you've got a diverse and possibly unexpectedly thrown together groups of people coming to your campaign for different reasons. So for pragmatic campaign points about that are that the campaign can then appeal to different kinds of journalists, so you get more chance of getting different kinds of coverage of the one issue again and again and again in different <coughs> ways with different stories. And if the campaign is aimed at policymakers, it's more likely that they'll think that it's a voting issue if they imagine constituents from across different sectors of society are concerned about it. So to illustrate that, in the libel reform campaign, we had lots of different people who wanted reform of the laws to be able to talk about claims people were making and products people were selling and the evidence for them. So doctors wanted to be able to discuss the safety of drugs. People on Mums Net wanted their members to be able to discuss parenting techniques. Consumer magazine, which wanted to not to have to battle to report the evidence that was coming out of lab tests on child car safety seats. And historians wanted to be able to write robustly about recent events. 
So all these different stories and people who are worried and worried about the same thing and were working towards the same aim, they would appeal to different people out in the public for different reasons. Some people want to read those books, some people would be a member of Mumsnet, some people will want to buy consumer review magazines that are not biased. So therefore there are lots of different ways of talking about the campaign and lots of different reasons for people to care. So we've learned that even though mass action and mass numbers are um, important, it is also possible for a small number of people, a relatively small number of people, to make a change in society. I'm thinking about when we launched our guide to peer review, 10 or more years, 10 years ago now, it was with a quite sceptical group of scientists and science publishers who kept telling us that nobody outside of science would be interested in this very inside baseball, esoteric issue. So we kind of absorbed that and didn't launch a large campaign around peer review. I mean, since then, the half a million requests and downloads we've had have proven them wrong, but we didn't launch a large campaign about it. But we did work with the quite small number of people who really, really cared about public understanding of peer review. And we worked with them to, we helped them to write to politicians and who were announcing policies to ask them as the evidence of the policy was based on peer reviewed evidence. And we helped them write to newspapers and ask science correspondents if the research they were reporting on has come from a peer review source or not. Now that our guide to peer review, because of that pressure from even a small number of people, now that guide is part of the training for senior civil servants in government. And there's been a culture change in reporting of science in the papers too. Nowadays, it's rare to see a science story without a citation, without a line in it somewhere saying, as reported yesterday in the BMJ or as announced at the European Cardiology Congress. And even a supporter of us just shared with us recently, actually, a reply she got back from the Reader's Letters editor of the Daily Mail, who told her that he was sick of getting letters about peer review, and put in quotes, every time they published a health or science story. So we know there aren't that many people writing, but even a few people can get on people's goats and can make an impact. The theme of all of our campaigning work is, like I said, the public interest in sound science and evidence. And we have that clear stance, that's our clear agenda of ours. And having that makes it easier for us to think then clearly and cleverly and strategically about how we should campaign and how we make judgments about the right thing to do at particular times during the campaign and in different situations. And I think it's the answer to the question a friend of ours asked us recently, which is, how is it that sense about science has never lost a campaign taken on? It's because we take everything that we learn about campaigning and all that we've learned from working with groups across society and we know how to point that in the right direction at the right time. We just launched <coughs> our what's going to be our biggest campaign so far, I think. It's called Ask for Evidence. And we think we will be able to make a lasting and profound change in society with it. Because we've been working for years with scientists and with the public to challenge misinformation about whether it's about the age of the Earth or radiation from mobile phones or cancer cures <coughs> or homeopathy, it's very effective when we do that, but no sooner has our and their, do our and their backs turn than misleading claims pop up again in different places. When the MS Society came to us a few years ago and told us they were getting increasingly concerned about people using their online patient support forums, coming on there, pretending to be family members of MS patients, but actually going on there to promote their own unproven treatments and saying things on these forums like, uh, my husband got out of his wheelchair for the first time in 25 years last week, and it's all because of this product. Really terrible stuff. They came to us and said, what are we supposed to do? Leave those forums and test out every link or every message that someone puts up there? That probably wouldn't work, even if they were able and had the resources to do that. So we realised that the way to inoculate people against those kinds of claims is to give them the questions to ask themselves. And that's what this new campaign is about. It's, not, it's something that everybody can do to ask for evidence. It's the only way to turn the tide on misleading claims and to put everybody in public life, whether politicians or companies or commentators or NGOs running campaigns or official bodies, holding them to account for claims that they're making. The only way to do that is to enable more people to understand evidence and ask for it and demand it from different people. 
So this is going to work because it's got all of those things that we learned that you need to campaign, which are broad and deep support from people, from unexpected people sometimes across society, and independently interesting and shareable materials and stories that you can put on your campaign website and share across social media. And then starting a discussion that we think society needs to start having. And that's how you start the revolution. Thank you very much, Sheila and Stephen. Um, <laughs> so we'll come to you for your ideas for Ferris campaigns in just in a moment. They think up your questions. Um, let me ask uh, you both, though, first of all, about um, the, the, the process of learning about how to do campaigns. Um, you know, from your point of view and yours, you, you, you've done several, you keep doing more. I mean, you've not stopped at Science is Vital. You, you, you're now an open access advocate, uh, and uh, you know, you're constantly meeting politicians and others to talk about this. So, you're, so there's, 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 there's something in there, there's a bug that's got into you about this. And, and of course, the Asperger's, that's another big campaign that's about science, that's about science. Um, I'd like to know what is it, what it is that has changed your campaign this much of the years. What is it that you, you now do at the beginning? What do you wish you'd known at the beginning of your very first campaign that some people might want to know if they've never done it before? Stephen. Uh, well, I would want to give people the impression that I spend my week uh, uh, speaking to <coughs> politicians every week, now and then, perhaps. Uh, I mean, I think you're right, it is infectious. You, you perhaps get a bug for it, but because if you see that you get involved and you can actually achieve something, then you think, well, when the next thing comes up, uh, or if there are other issues that you're passionate about, then you maybe uh, believe that, that there are ways to do um, something about that. And you know, open access is one of the things that I've picked up in the last um, couple of years. And there, um, I mean, it's, I'm not, it's the trouble with open access is it's such a broad church and there's so many different people. I don't know if there's a single coherent organization that operates within that sphere. Um, there are so many different voices. But you can, I think you can still campaign in a way and have an effect. What I've done there really is, uh, is mostly through my blog or uh, writing. Uh, but I think it's important to choose your audience. And so with open access, it is about um, trying to engage some public support um, for it. But it's also about then speaking to the constituency who are the community of scientists, many of whom st still remain skeptical about the real value of it, and they really rather publish in their so-called top-tier journals um, all the time. And I've been having a conversation with the <coughs> Imperial College Secretary this week, who made some comments that I didn't agree with on Monday, but each to their own. But, uh, and and um, I guess once you get a, a, a certain prominence and voice then, you do get opportunities to meet other people. So I, you know, I have been at meetings where I've met Janet Finch of the, um, of the famous Finch um, Working Party and various librarians around the country and various other interests. I've been invited, I've spoken to publishers uh, and things like that. And these opportunities arise, I think, once you actually wake up and become active. I haven't, there's nothing <coughs> magical or special about this. It's just I've made an effort. And I think, uh, again, one of the messages that this facility is available to everybody if you're passionate about it, if you're articulate. I think you have to be, I mean, my news operandi, I hope most of the time, is to try and foster dialogue. You know, I want to speak to people and I want to hear what they have to say. So I will talk, I have to talk to people with the opposite viewpoint, and uh, that's been other colleagues of mine in scientists who are totally skeptical about open access journals. Uh, humanity scholars who have a very different perspective on the subject, and that's actually an area I think needs to be explored um, more deeply. I think they've been forgotten to some degree uh, in, the in the debates that have gone on. Um, and the publishers and journals uh, as well, who obviously have very particular views. And I think it's important to try and understand you know, their viewpoint. I mean, most people are acting fairly rationally. They're usually just acting in their particular interests. And um, I have a particular set of, or a particular viewpoint on what I think my interest in is what I think the public interest is, and uh, you know, that those are the areas I'm trying to explore. So there are different ways that you can do it, but I think it's always about making sure that you get your message across and that you're then listening uh, back again. Sheila, what, what is it you want? You wish you'd known this campaign? <coughs> We've learned an awful, awful lot about using resources we have available as efficiently as possible. And by resources, <coughs> I don't necessarily mean money. I usually mean time and manpower that we have available to us in the most efficient way possible to get the most out of it. 
by working smartly and by realising, and we have to keep reminding ourselves of this like every single day, that it doesn't always have to be us who does something. So working, working smartly, by that I mean there are often ways you can shortcut having to do something if you do one other thing. So, for example, you may need to reach every government minister with a message. So what you could do is write to them all and ask for a meeting and go meet them and tell them all of this. Or something that might shortcut this is get an op-ed piece in the Times, because you know that their team will read that, every single one of their team will read that every morning. And it may be that you have a way you need to do that, and that might be a much quicker, more efficient way of working. So it's thinking of those kind of shortcuts that get you to the same end, but uses a lot less of your time and, and money to do so. And the, the biggest lesson is that it doesn't always have to be us doing things. The most important resource you'll have are the people who join the campaign, the people who sign up and add their name to a petition. So you definitely want to capture as much of detail from them as you can. You definitely want a way to get in touch with them, probably an email address in the future. You definitely need to start building your sort of other campaign team around you, all these people who have signed up. And they can be doing exactly the same kind of things that you're doing. They can be getting lots of other people to sign up every time an organisation joins. They should get two others in their networks to join up to. Everybody who signs up should tell 10 of their friends or colleagues to sign up as well. So it's realising that you don't have to talk to everybody yourself. You've got all of these people and organisations who are as passionate about it as you are because they're going to your campaign or they're signing their petition. And the most efficient way and the most uh, the way you get the most out of it is getting all of them to become campaigners with you, too. Thanks, Sheila. One more question before I turn it over to you, you guys. Um, you both mentioned um, the importance of getting newspaper articles in, for example, or creating spots on the news by wearing my coats, essentially media stunts and things. Um, how important is that, in given that people can tweet and, and blog quite effectively with large audiences these days uh, and build campaigns that way. I mean, how much effort should you really put, if you've got a very small campaign, into essentially what is the role of a media officer to try and push this stuff forward? Short answer is, it depends. It depends who you're trying to influence at any one time. If, for example, it's politicians, then an op-ed piece in The Times will have a lot of impact on them. If you need a thousand, 10,000 more people to sign your petition and uh, push it out across social media, how would we do that as effectively? But to reach more people, we know that um, even though fewer people are reading newspapers, a lot of people still do read newspapers, especially online. So having interesting photographs and interesting stories on the front page of the Guardian website would reach a lot more people than you can reach with a you know, mass email out or for most people a tweet or something on Facebook. You definitely need to work through um, networks in that way as well. You need to work through it, all the intermediary layers of people that you work with to get clearly you get people to retweet and to reshare everything that you share, and that's how you reach out to more people. So when you have competing and interesting stories that you can pick up from the Garden website, it's easier to share things and get more people clicking and aware of the campaign when you have those interesting things. Um, Stephen, science is vital. The gang on social media was sort of fostered there. And in large part, it existed mostly on social media. It wouldn't have happened without that. But what was it that really stepped up into, into getting mainstream media attention? Uh, I think it was um, actually getting big name support behind the campaign very early on. Sort of helped to give us, uh, get us uh, early attention. I mean, okay, I've written an article in The Guardian, and you know, much like my The Guardian. I don't know how much that in itself generated um, interest in it. But certainly, as I said, you know, getting Dara Bray in, we had Patrick Moore. Um, sort of support the campaign and Brian Cox and that you know so that does help to garner attention and I think uh, you know the, the stunt with the white coats I do think that those sorts of things are important but I'm, but stunts in themselves aren't going to make or break a campaign and um, don't kid yourselves that it's, you just need a good stunt and then you'll you'll win it has to be tied to a coherent message with targeted uh, specific goals in mind for the campaign you may remember a couple of years ago there was an outfit called science for the future appeared and they had quite a cute stunt. They had a hearse dragged across through the streets of Westminster with the British Science in on a coffin and represented British Science. And it was reported in the papers, it's true, but uh, what was it about uh, and where are they now? 
and their, their campaign, to my mind, was largely focused on sort of internal dissatisfaction among the chemistry community with the grant funding mechanisms of the EPSRC, which was a little bit niche. Um, <laughs> so it didn't necessarily have the um, sort of public appeal that the issue that Science is Vital spoke to, which was, you know, we think science is an important part of uh, British life. We think it's important economically. It's a very difficult argument to make. But it was one that captured the public uh, attention at the time because it had come in, you know, we knew we were heading into austerity, and so, you know, it was an issue that was already discussed in the paper. So by all means, use a stunt to get a bit of attention, but you're, you're wasting your time unless you've tied it to um, a, a well thought out campaign. All right, thank you very much. Um, and now over to you. Do you have microphones? Yeah. Uh, oh, we do. Um, you don't need a microphone, do you? <laughs> All right, um, who would like to ask a question? Bear in mind, please give us examples of campaigns you've run. Uh, I'm sure you have to. Uh, the things you've learned from there. If there are campaigns you think should run or you'd like someone to see do, then this is the place to start talking about them. And if you've got skills and things that might help those things run, give me what we've heard today, and please also talk about those as well. And uh, tell us who you are as well. So here in front. Uh, so, I'm Peter Murray Rust, uh, University of Cambridge and Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, I work within the law up till now, but there comes a time when. <laughs> <laughs> it, there comes a time when negotiation fails. Uh, my grandmother chained herself to the railings in front of Parliament to win the votes. Win. Negotiation would not have worked. Uh, Penguin uh, published Lady Chatley in defiance of the Lord Chancellor to show that one could use four-letter words in uh, quality English literature. So, we've come to an impasse on the question of the right of machines to read the content in the scientific literature. And I hope this isn't a niche area because it's very important. It's worth many billions of dollars a year. So the situation is... I can read the literature in Cambridge because I subscribe to it, but Cambridge University has negotiated with the publishers that I'm not allowed to use machines uh, to read the literature. And that is probably true of every university in this room, and I'm going to use FOI over the next two uh, weeks or so to find out what the universities have signed, because I think our fundamental rights have been signed away. So I have a campaign. I launched it on Monday, and the campaign is to read every scientific fact in the literature, regardless of whether it is in the open access literature or the closed literature, because I believe that is actually legally my right. And on my side, I have the Hargreaves in Initiative in this country, which is pushing for this to be legislated in the UK uh, in 2014, when they say that they will override anything the publishers put in our way. On the other hand, a number of us, including the British Library, JISC, uh, universities, have tried to negotiate in Europe, and Europe has thrown us away because it's been lobbied by uh, uh, forces which wish to license the right uh, for us to read what we already have the right. And it is making a close market of something. It is actually the enclosure of the digital commons. Because that's a very eloquent uh, campaign that's happening. I'm hoping you're going to get... Um, some support for that. Um, there are when you're seeing, you said you launched a campaign on Monday. Yep. So you want people to come up to you after this and bash their what's it, what's it called? These things with you. Huh? Yeah. Well, I, I don't actually approve of these because I think that they're okay. Well, they for this country, they can give you their cards yes. instead. How about that? Yes. Um, <laughs> but, but open access certainly is an issue that's been discussed a lot in this in this uh, conference. So there's probably a lot of people who will um, who will you know, go along with that as well. Um, Stephen, you're an open access advocate. Are you going to join? You uh, should, you should, you should. I'm here with the campaign on Monday, but I'm definitely going to it's only on, yes, on my I'm blog, but I'm applying for funding. Right. Good, good on you. Well, good. Exactly. Are you applying to funding for to basically break the law? Uh, no, I said I'm not going to break the law. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm applying to the Shuttleworth Foundation for a personal fellowship to build a community which is going to develop this which will be so powerful that it will be an unstoppable wave of people doing something which is 20 years overdue. Well, let's hope that there's someone in this room, will, many people in this room will join you in that yep. case. So, uh, anyone else who's going to start a campaign? Over there. Hi, I'm Alan Kavinetsky, work for Medicine Sans Frontières. So, um, 
really inspiring to see science campaigns in the public domain more than ever before. And I studied as science communications postgraduate course at the UL, and um, certainly sense of our science is only just getting started. So um, there's also more science than ever before. Um, and evaluation seems like a little mini revolution that's happening. Certainly, science funders through the REF are all just submitting at the moment, and also as part of the work we're doing at MSF is to look at evaluating the broader kind of societal impact of research. But my question. Given that there's a, a hell of a lot of good evidence, there's a lot of bad evidence, but there's a hell of a lot of good evidence, how particularly in the case of Sounds About Science, um, do you um, filter the science that supports your campaigns and potentially what do you see the role of being more scientific in how you pick key evidence, given there's so much evidence out there? Do you see the science of science being the new revolution? Uh, yes, I think so. I think. We, like I said, we work with an enormous number of scientists and science bodies, and they help us filter the evidence. We, in our kind of own small way, do a lot of uh, crowdsourcing. We do rely on the experts to tell us what to look at, and then we filter that sort of smaller subset of things ourselves, I guess. But yes, the science of science, the public literacy in science, um, helping other people filter all the evidence out there is indeed the next revolution, I think, and it's definitely part of how we're growing, and it's part of what we know works, and it's, it's been our, our modus operandi for a couple of years now. So we always say that the status of evidence for of findings is as important as the findings themselves, and that's what the Ask for Evidence campaign, which wraps up all the work now, is about, and that's what Sense About Science has always been about. We always say, we kind of don't, in some ways, care whether this one particular paper gets proven to be right or gets proven to be wrong in the future. Right now, what you can do is ask questions about um, how was it how was it peer-reviewed and where it's published and what do other people say about it and who else has scrutinised and who else has said something about it. So those kind of tools of making sense of what's in front of you or what's important to us and are shareable with everybody in the, in the community, not just the science community, but everybody, they don't consider themselves a scientist or interested in science and ask those kind of questions. And use, uh, use that, those questions as a way of, um, of finding things out that are wrong or they're being missold things. I mean, these are the sort of old skeptics have questions, aren't they, which are becoming yeah, become more sophisticated. Um, some more questions, please. Did you want to come back on that talk? The one thing no. that you said at the beginning is, is something that many of us have mentioned, actually, but is something that's changed in the UK, at least, and is beginning to change in the US in the last few years, and it's that scientists are getting out a bit more now than earlier. It's okay to do it now, isn't it? That's yeah, nice. it's in fact just become embedded in lots of research grants. So it's become part of how people work. Talking about your research to the public and public engagement is, is as much part of a lot of scientists' work as Is it quite painful public engagement? So that's what I was going to yeah, ask yeah. the audience. Do you, what do you think? Maybe we think it should be. That should be in the rest, shouldn't it? Well, yeah, I think it is, as long as it doesn't piss your uh, vice-chancellor off or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying you should please your vice-chancellor, but it won't be. It's a different activity, I and mean, public engagement generally, I guess, politically neutral, shall we say. It's about um, helping people to understand science or get allowing the public to talk to scientists. Whereas campaigning, then, you are turning into an, an advocate for a particular viewpoint. So it, you know, it's very definitely a political stance, and so it's quite different from just a conversation about science with the public. So I'm really aware of that, and in my position at the Tripton University, I have to be careful about that. But <coughs> my, uh, I guess there's still quite a bit of latitude in the idea of academic. I think it's too late for you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> You've crossed over. I think also, just at the risk of not being neutral in this, uh, as, as, a, as a moderator, I think the idea of science being somehow public engagement activity of just telling people things. Is, is inherently a bad idea because once you've gone to the education bit, you need to tell them why you think it's important and everyone is a, is a political animal. And politics being transparent is surely better than pretending you have none at all. Um, and everyone else is doing this, by the way. All the campaign that both these guys are talking about, all the other people out there are doing it to politicians and members of the public and stuff. It's a lovely idea that perhaps science is just going to filter itself out there because it's correct in a way that uh, you all think it is. Uh, but actually, it's not going to happen like that. And we think, I think that what I'm saying is that I think in the last decade, things have become much more sophisticated and are moving in the direction of persuasion, in what I think, which is important. Yes, uh, there's a question here, and then we'll go to you. Hi. Um, my question is, uh, as a member of the public, 
I feel I've got the right to actually be told both sides of the stories. So the lady was talking about sense about science. But um, is that the whole story? Because clinical trials, a lot of them have failed. A lot of them have not been proven. How much are the scientists or the doctors being paid by the drug corporations? How much fear do the drug corporations have of indigenous medicine, which is just a flaky kitchen remedy? So I'd be very uh, skeptical of how balanced this information is, especially if I was to go to countries like India or China, where medicine has existed for thousands of years, well before Christ, and they don't, they didn't have journals in those times, they just had tablets which were, not like these ones, they just made out of stone. So they would just inscript anything from those stone tablets. So, um, what, how do you calculate what science is? How do you determine what science is? How do you test the parameters? And how is that science different from the science that has existed for thousands of years? Your question seems to be a, a sort of an um, extension of one of our previous ones about acceptable evidence. There is actually a session on this, I'm looking at my um, book, book here uh, at 3 o'clock, yeah. but the campaigns aren't the whole story. I think that's fairly... It's kind of fair. Yeah. Yeah. Every campaign yeah. will have an end and we'll have, we'll have to take a position on an issue and say, yeah. we care about this and this is what we want to change and we're going to change it in this way. And here are arguments for doing that. Of course, part of our campaign as well is answering the other side's arguments too. So as much as you want to put your side of the story, you have to be always listening and looking for the arguments that are coming back against you and responding to those so that those people who you want to be your campaigners out there have sort of that ammunition in their hands as well and are able to answer um, arguments they hear back. Um, I'm not sure what information you're skeptical about. I think it's clinical trial information. Is that right? No, just, um, just the fact that oh, information. institutes... No, 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 no. Not about science. I'm, I'm just saying that just one source of information is never the absolute truth. So you've got to have all sorts of information. Exactly, that's what science is, isn't but it? It's what testing is, and testing. My question is that how do you determine what science is? How do you calculate the premises of science? Seems to be like quite a large question for this yeah. last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't answer that right now. Um, but I will ask uh, Stephen just to comment really briefly on this, on this thing, which is simply that it, are scientists a bit hamstrung by activism and campaign because, because you're meant to be sort of seeing all sides of the story, so if you try and persuade someone of one thing, then, then you're not seeing all the other bits and pieces. You know they're there. Well, I, you know, I think if you are you know, getting involved in a very particular campaign and you are then identified as a, a working scientist, you do have to be a little bit careful about it. And it but, but uh, I think, as you say, you know, it's, it's important to be open about it because otherwise then people will not you know, trust your position. I certainly don't think, and I agree with the implication of what you said, that you know, science isn't really about objectivity, as it were, although we, we strive for objectivity, but we, you know, we are human and people make mistakes. And you talk about absolute truth. Well, that, uh, you know, science doesn't deal in absolute truth. We deal in quantifying uncertainty, and we try to minimize the uncertainties about the things that we think that we know, but we uh, we almost um, you know always are constantly revising, updating what it is that we think that we know. So it's a it's a moving conversation, and it's very important I think then to bring people along with that conversation and to be upfront in a way I think that sometimes politicians are uncomfortable with in quantifying uncertainty, in dealing with areas where you know it's, it is difficult, which then makes it you know very difficult for politicians to act. The whole celebrity these days being climate change. You know, we are talking about modeling the <coughs> change in the Earth's climate over the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years because we need to do that because we need to think about well, what are the policy implications today for those possible changes? Right. Nobody can predict with absolute certainty what is the climate change going to be. There are huge error bars on these things. And we have to be upfront about that as a scientific community, but we also have to, have to then help politicians and the public to sort of grapple with these quite complicated ideas and and you know have a conversation about it. But, but it is important to be uh, honest. Thanks, Stephen. Um, we're having to wrap up now, uh, but thank you very much to Sheila Lane and Stephen Curry. I hope this session's 
inspired you somewhat uh, and uh, put some fire into your cells. That's, that's a mixed metaphor, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever, fire into your cells for, uh, to, to start your own campaigns. Uh, so can you please join me in uh, thanking them and also the organizer of the